Welcome to the WA Property Q&A, the podcast where I explore the ins and outs of buying property in Western Australia. I'm your host, Peter Fletcher, and each week I interview local property experts to help you to develop a deep understanding of the nuances of buying property in WA. From market trends to legal considerations, no topic is off limits. But before we dive in, a friendly reminder, while we provide valuable information, it's important to note that nothing discussed in this podcast should be construed as personal investment advice. Always remember to seek the appropriate professional advice for your specific circumstances. Now, let's get started and unlock the secrets to successful property buying in WA. Welcome to another episode of the WA Property Q&A podcast, and uh, I'm excited uh, this week. I have with me none other than Peter Brewer. Now, Pete sent me this great long... um, I think the word just we're looking for is diatribe. <laughs> it was it was a it was a big introduction, and uh, it's it, it's it's a, an introduction big enough to fit the man. Like it, it's, a, it's a big Queensland. <laughs> when you said this was going to be a long episode, I thought if I could beef it up with half an hour of introduction, it might at least fill up some of the time. Thank you, Pete. The, it's awesome yeah. to be on your podcast as someone. <laughs> Who has? No, I mean it. As someone who's admired you for well, four four decades, um, it's an honour, mate, to spend a bit of time and and uh, shooting the breeze between both of us, talking about the the thing that we're probably most passionate about, and that is the industry of real estate. Yeah, and I think that's that that'd be a good thing to to do, Pete. Is just uh, is shoot the breeze about about the property industry and industry that served us pretty well. Let's mm. face it. Um, but I, I do want to, you know, a bit of an introduction. And when, when I, I think when I met, first met you in person was uh, at a, a professionals conference in, uh, in was it Queenstown? No, it was actually at 517 uh, High Street at the King's Ambassador Hotel in Perth. That's where I can reckon it was. Um, uh, really? And, uh, yeah, it was... Um, it was a conference there that they had speakers such as um, the guy that had the the motor dealerships over there, um, Skipper John John, um, John Hughes, yes. John Hughes, um, Dr. Tony Fountain, a guy called Winston Marsh, I think spoke. But it was a stellar lineup of really good presenters, and it was such a great opportunity to get the Queenslanders and the West Australians together in the professionals at that time together, and we came back from. West from West Australia back to sunny Queensland with so many cool ideas from the things that you guys were doing over there and doing so well around exclusive agencies and vendor uh, paid marketing and and really professional marketing. So it was you know it was certainly something that helped to kickstart my real estate career. I, I loved my time there. And um, and the meeting that I was referring to um, in was it Queenstown. We, we 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 certainly have had another another meeting in in Queenstown, absolutely. And that was the meeting where you gave me a sneak peek at the the professionals, new professionals livery. <laughs> that was that was now that was for, that's fast forwarding. Yeah, it was about two thousand. That was um, that was um, some people say the evolution of the professionals brand. I prefer to call it the revolution. Of the, the professionals brand, and it was it was uh, an exercise that polarised um, the organisation, but it was a much needed revamp to take it away from a very male dominated brand um, to um, a very female friendly brand, and, and a really good thing I thought. But certainly, we divided the country. Um, yeah, it was it was a big shift uh, for the pros back then um, because. Uh, our font was Rockwell, which, if you want a, a masculine font, you uh, would look no further than Rockwell, um, and it was just black and red. Um, uh, so it, it was a big move back then. You know, it, it was, Pete, and, and I think one of the things that was really interesting, um, and I'm cautious in, no, I'll just say it because you know me, <laughs> sometimes you just say stuff. But I remember... Shit. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, but I remember when we did it, it was, you know, like it, it freshened the brand dramatically. It made us more female friendly. But I made the observation with the assistance of a couple of other people. I walked into an office we had on the north side of Brisbane. And before the branding changed, it was a really conservative office. You, we, the branding happened. It looked magnificent on the outside. But when you walked inside, there were still two 75-year-old men sitting back with an ashtray and, and, and their durries sit, sitting in the tray. And, they, and you walk in and they say, G'day, what do you want? And, and, it, and it just reminded me, and it's such a good, it was such a good lesson that all we did in a lot of cases there was we put lipstick on a pig. And and uh, and it's such an important lesson to so many people and so many businesses. You know, you can rebrand yourself as much as you like, but unless you change the culture or make sure the culture fits the brand, then you got some you know you got some challenges, and that became a bigger challenge for us to change some of the behaviours um, across that organisation and the offices and across the profession generally. And I think there's an underlying lesson all the way through of change that we need to embrace. Otherwise, we're ultimately just putting lips to God pig. Changing culture is always the hard part. Tough, tough, tough. Um, it's one of the things that's tough about leadership is, you know, is those lessons of taking people on the journey with us. And so many of us struggle to do that. We, you know, we, we wake up these great ideas or we go to a conference and we come back with great ideas and, and then somehow or other we've got to get the team to buy into that culture. Um, and uh, and and get them to, to be with us. Otherwise, all of a sudden, you know, you're three parts into the journey, and you look around from the bottom to the top of the mountain, and you go, "Hello, is anyone left there? Where are you all?" Um, so yeah, it, it is hard, but you know, it's a worthwhile exercise because those businesses that do get the culture right and have got the right people on the bus, and if they're all facing forward, you know, business becomes a whole lot easier, doesn't it? But I think we've got to be harder in doing that. We've got to be, you know, I love that. Be, you know, it's, it's cliche, but it's, you know, slow to hire, fast to fire. If you don't fit in, do the other thing. You know, F off. <laughs> now, Pete, you had a very high profile office back in the day. Um, yeah. And I, I think you were the the chair of, of the, uh, the Queensland professionals. And I, I think you might've gone on and become the chair of uh, the uh, pros nationally um and now you are the the chair of the reiq queensland yeah. have, I, have i wrapped that up you've done it perfectly mate that's exactly that's exactly what it is and and pete that kind of stems for me from uh something my oldies said to me a bazillion years ago if you see things that need change don't sit back and whinge about it if you're not part of the solution you're part of the problem. And so if you want to see change and advocate for change, and then you know, get involved or shut up. You know? And uh, so you know, at various stages, there's things I felt that I wanted to contribute to both the professions and also the, the Institute here. And uh, so I put my hand up and I've got involved and I've loved it. I love that, you know, that blokes like you and I with the time we've had in the industry and the knowledge we've got at all levels, because you and I have seen it all, Fletch, you know, from, you know, assistant property managers through to salespeople to business owners. You know, we, you know we've done, we've seen every aspect of, of, the, of the business. And so I think we can overlay some of that wisdom um, and, uh, and really help make this great profession an even better profession. So, yeah, you know, and, and I know you've had your, you know, you, you, the fact that you're doing this, I think, is magnificent. I know you had some time on the REWA board. Um, so you're a guy that likes to influence change as well it's important do you think you you move the needle in the right direction with the pros uh i, I certainly do yeah i i believe i did 100 percent, i did um you know what, what would be your legacy there oh good i think that branding exercise was a really important part for me um uh changing our I remember walking in one day and we'd employed a new ceo um in queensland and I couldn't miss her. I couldn't meet him there on the first day. And I, I rang and I said, welcome, gonna, great to have you on board. I'll pop it and see you tomorrow, have a chat. And I said, how are you going? He said, oh, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit underwhelmed. And I said, so what are you underwhelmed about? He said, well, you know, the, 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 the way the place is laid out, um, the paint job, uh, my desk, my chair, you know, I'm just underwhelmed at that. And I went, well, 
from day one I realised we had a problem there because this guy was more worried about how wide his desk was and how comfortable his chair was than mm. the opportunity before him. Uh, and that would actually made his career um, quite short-lived and said to me, I need to get in and make this about the membership and about you know, what that organisation actually stood for. And that was about training and marketing and development and, and helping businesses run, you know, profitable offices. So I think that's a that's a legacy I'm proud of. Um, our business management staff I'm very proud of, um, building relationships across our great country with some magnificent people in WA and Kiwi land and the other states as well. You know, we, we, uh, we did some good stuff to really build that brand and the culture inside of it. Is the industry doing enough in training? Do, do, do we actually do enough or do we, are we paying lip service to it? Uh, I think we do enough in training. So generally speaking, I think most of the institutes do enough in training. I think what we've got is um, we have an apathy problem in our industry um, that nothing ever suits people in terms of when the training's on or whether it's online or whether it's in person or whether it's on a Tuesday or whether it's on a Friday, you know. Um, you know. Uh, so I think the offerings are there. There's no shortage of things that you can do in this business at your own pace or, you know, um, uh, but people find all kinds of excuses not to attend stuff and then whinge about um, you know, it's fascinating. Here's an example. Um, you know, we put on a, a pretty fancy event here last year in Queensland for, tra for training. And um, uh, people say, oh, look, it's so expensive. And, you know, for us regional people, it's really, really hard to come down for that, that event, you know, uh, and it's on a Tuesday or a Friday, whatever it was. And, uh, and I went, okay, I'm thinking, well, what else do we change? How do we make it easier for regional people? And two Saturdays later, they were down here for a U2 concert with their family. <laughs> okay. It's all about so, entertainment, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't come to the conference to, uh, to better your skills and to make yourself a more professional real estate agent. But baby, hit me with that rhythm stick. To put the tape with that UT concert. <laughs> and, and maybe that's where the the institute needs to be a bit smarter. They maybe they could be doing package deals. Um, you get uh, a day of training plus a YouTube uh, a YouTube uh, <laughs> ticket, all for the low price of fifteen hundred and forty seven. <laughs> it's an absolute bargain. So it's where we put the value, isn't it? You know, because I think there is some. You know, there, there's no shortage. Um, you know, and and I think you know we've um, franchises, marketing groups, institutes have all got a. To think more creative about, creatively about how we deliver that training, you know, um, five years or pre-COVID, so, you know, four or five years ago, we bought a brand new building over here with room for 300 people in three training rooms and, and it was magnificent. And now, you know, we've, re we've leased all that space out uh, and 95% mm -hmm. of our training is now delivered online because um, uh, it just is, it's convenient for people. We still get a small percentage that say, oh, I want to come and sit in the classroom. And we facilitate that as well because you've got to be, you know, you've got to do that. But no, I think there's, uh, there's lots of training. I think, um, uh, I think there is an absolute opportunity, Pete, in this world of AI and new technology for institutes and franchise groups, preferably institutes, to take a genuine leadership role in where business uh, needs to go with things like AI. The opportunity is magnificent, but I think most businesses are struggling with just dealing with business as usual without layering on digital media, um, Facebook, um, websites, SEO, TikTok, AI, you know, well, you know, and in the meantime, we're struggling, you know, so which, which kind of takes me to what does that future real estate business look like? Um, and I think that suburban a uh, person, a uh, suburban office with two property managers, 250 managements and two or three salespeople is under absolute threat um, and is probably going to be, um, you know, gobbled up by the bigger, better and bolder ones um, that provide provide all of the services that allow um, people just to be go out and, and just be really good real estate people. 100%. Um, just, I, I want to come back to that point that you just made there about the, the big ones gobbling up um, other the smaller operators. But let's um, roll back to the, the issue of, of AI um, yes. and and training on AI. Uh, I attended a, a REWA 
um, course on Tuesday, and uh, it was called uh, Rewa Innovate, um, and uh, it was genuinely innovative. Um, the speakers, uh, uh, the the one guy's name is Daywood. Daywood. Um, geez, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. Yeah. Uh, but wow, he was amazing. Um, and uh, the guy that followed him was uh, just as good. Um, there was some really, really good stuff where, where it, it had people thinking, uh, how can I apply this to my office? What what can I do next? And um, there was there were some people in the room that were genuinely excited about uh, about what's what's going on. And I would say that it's probably the best day of training I have ever experienced inside the professionals oh, oh sorry inside in, inside real estate yeah. full stop it's, uh, it was a re, what, it's one of the best days it, it, very very it, very good was the, 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 the bit that you enjoyed was it around opening your eyes to the opportunities was that the key part did the light come on to go wow and we could do this oh my god where can we take it or what was the what was the 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 big yeah, so, for, so for me, it was it was just that sense of possibility that was that was evident in the room, um, and it it was um, for the longest time, and even even up to to today, we we have uh, conferences where um, people get up and talk about their you know their their story and how they grew up on the wrong side of the track and <laughs> got their life back together and. <laughs> <laughs> and now they drive yeah. a, a Lamborghini and a you know <laughs> and 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 then they you know well watch watch your scripts and dialogues and I I, I remember you know some years ago at one of the pro, uh, one of the Rewa conferences we um, it was a CPD day and it was a, it was the Rewa Connect conference which is the big conference for the year. And uh, I was uh, doing the, the Rewa social media at the time and uh, I, I grabbed this speaker, one of the, the big trainers in, in Australia, grabbed this speaker as, uh, as he was about to run out the back of the room and head to the airport. And I, I said, what is, you know, if for all the real estate agents in the room, what would be your number one um, script or dialogue that they could use to make them uh, more successful. And he said, well, I would say, um, Mr. and Mrs. Vendor, if I had a property, uh, had a buyer that suited your home, um, uh, should I sell them something else or would you like me to show them yours? And I looked at him and I went, and he was 100% serious. And, and it was <laughs> like that... That line I had read in a Tom Hopkins book back in 1985. <laughs> I was going to say, Tom Hopkins is going through it. <laughs> it was just like, compare that with what I experienced on Tuesday, and it yeah. was all brand new. It was all, wow, I'd, I've yeah. never seen this before. And, um, I, and I have zero question that it is going to shape the way we do business um, in, in the next Three months, totally. not three years, but the next three months. Totally with you. Totally with you. I, I, you know, I know you've recently been to Eric, and, and and neither of us would want to make this an Eric bashing exercise. But I did write after last year's Eric, the twenty fifth anniversary. Um, what had changed over twenty five years, and the only thing that changed is, was the lack of implementation. Uh, it's still the same scripts and dialogues that Tom Hopkins taught us. 25, 30 years ago, being regurgitated back out, you know, it's the, you know, um, you know, you know, it's all. I mean, look, those scripts, you know, have stood me well for a long time in, in my real estate yeah. uh, sales career. Yeah. But uh, you know, people go along, they throw their panties at the stage, they spend a small fortune, and they walk away, and very few people actually implement. And that's going to be the challenge with the AI stuff: is that how do businesses operate business as usual, as well as plug in these opportunities? Um, that, that, that come, and I, I think you're right. It is over the next three months, not the next three years, or not a slow burn. Uh, this is stuff that you can start to plug in in a serious way today if we open our minds to it and if we work with the right people. And I believe that's where the institutes um, 
preferably have a part to play in in uh, and take in taking people down that that path. Otherwise, you know, if we leave it to others, I can see us becoming it becoming a very expensive product that probably doesn't need to be that expensive um, if it got falls into the hands of the wrong technology people. Mm -hmm. So. On the subject of the institutes, um, yes, they are effectively a franchise um, or a marketing group or a, a something. Um, is there a tension between the the REIs in Australia and um, and the big marketing groups, so your, your Harcourts and your Ray Whites and your, your Hookers? I'm going to say yes, and I know that some people will want to. You know, there'll be shock, stun, horror. The REIQ chairman, you know, slams franchise groups. <laughs> oh, look, I know that someone will want to pick that up as a headline. Here, folks. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think what tension is there is a totally unnecessary tension. Um, that's been, it's, you know, it's one of those things that gets passed down through generations, you know, um, uh, institute bad. It's even the words a horrible word. I hate the word institute, you know. It kind of, it conjures up, uh, you know, uh, thoughts of, you know, the royal and ancient order of the froth blowers, you know. It's kind of, you know, it's... <laughs> that, that yeah, is look, a good order, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, yeah. I you know, all the, all the pewter mugs on the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think you know. So you know, it's poor word in in you know, it's in in twenty twenty four. I you know, it's not a word I'm comfortable with. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, but I think it's a long held thing that people go, oh, you know, it's the institute, all oh, those old boys, you know, they don't really understand it. Yada yada yada. I think if you start to look at the institutes around Australia now, um, and this you know, this gets into hairy ground for a lot of people. Um, you know, most of the institutes now being uh, the CEOs are women, there's strong representation on the boards, and they, you know, I'm just going to say it, women get shit done. Um, and I think we've got some really proactive and aggressive CEOs doing some amazing stuff. And uh, potentially that might be a threat to some of the franchise groups as well, I'm not sure. See, I think there's a tension there that doesn't need to be there. Um, there is only one voice in each of those states that's fronting up to the respective state parliaments or the to the lawmakers and advocating for property owners' rights and for, the, and for, you know, for a fair and healthy real estate profession, and that's the REIs in each state. And if you don't have those in there fighting for you, I can promise you, It'll be anarchy. You know, it just will be. I, you know, I get to spend a fair bit of time looking at uh, proposed legislation, and it scares me, Fletch. Um, some of the stuff that these crazy pollies and their department heads propose, we get to look at it and go, <laughs> "You can't be serious." I think in the last lot of legislative reforms, and, and bear in mind, in Queensland, we've had five consecutive years of rental reforms. Five consecutive wow. years of rental reforms. You know, wow. I don't know. How does a property how does a property manager or a real estate agent keep pace with five consecutive years of rental reforms? Um and, and um uh and uh you know in, in the last round we managed to achieve thirty nine changes of stuff that was put up. Now, if you haven't got a, a you know a good healthy REI with a focus on advocating for your profession and for a healthier real estate uh, profession, then you're going to have serious problems. And that's why I think the franchise groups um, and and anyone that says, oh, you know, what are the what do the REIs do? Well, what they do is they keep the industry pretty healthy for you, and without them, you got some trouble. So I think you know, put all the crap that you might have, you know, all those past you know, craziness that's gone through your head aside and support your REI because they're good people who are trying to do good stuff for you. Mm, mm. What is the role of, of the Real Estate Institute of tomorrow? Great question. It's a great question. I think it is to continue to advocate. I, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't even write that down before. So <laughs> I said to you that, that we were going to get off topic. Yeah, no, that's good. No, I love it. Um, it, it is a great question um, because, you know, different people will tell you different things, that their belief. My belief it is to absolutely maintain its relevance to the profession. It's to keep, to keep the battleground fair. So not to weight it strongly towards uh, real estate agents or to home sellers or to home buyers or to tenants or landlords, just to keep it fair and reasonable. Um, you know, when you've, we've had five consecutive years of... of uh, 
of reforms, something says to me there's a bias that's probably headed in the wrong direction. It was the great Kerry Bullmore, Kerry Francis Bullmore Packer, that said, um, every time you introduce a new piece of legislation, you take someone else's rights away. Um, and uh, you know, we have governments that continue to, you know, to, to give us those challenges and to take people's rights away. And so I think it is to, to maintain a healthy uh, environment for the real estate profession. I think it is to keep the standards as high as we possibly can. And I know, Pete, you and I have talked about this in the past, that it absolutely craps me to tears when we wake up each year and see the latest, because the AC Nielsen report that talks about real estate agents and sex workers and politicians are on the same band. You and I have been around this crazy business enough to know that that probably represents 10% of the industry, the dickhead factor. The other 90% are just really good people doing the right thing. Um, and so it's to uphold the standards of that 90%, try and take the other 10% with us in some form, um, educate, um, push for harder CPD um, and push for government to eradicate some of the crap that still manages to find its way into our profession. So I think it's important for us to be there. Um, I think it's important for us to be providing uh, great education, great marketing, educating consumers on what a transaction is. Again, I'll go back to it. You know, if you look at five years of consecutive rental reforms, um, yet not a dollar spent, not a serious dollar spent on educating the consumers um, or real estate agents on how that all works. Um, that's just crazy, isn't it? Like, you know, bring in all this legislation. Yeah. Don't actually yeah. teach anyone how, how, you know, how and why and, 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 mm. and then expect everyone to sort it out. So for us, I think there's a massive opportunity for us to be educating consumers on rights and responsibilities and otherwise people just make shit up as they go. Um, so we've got an important job to play to explain it to real estate professionals and also to the public. Here in WA, we've uh, we've got a well. Kath's no longer new, but um, recently minted CEO, shall we say, yep. um, Kath Hart, and uh, just a, just a super super powerful human being, and uh, you know really doing some good things. And um, what what is interesting is that uh, she's she's taking the the local institute, I think, in a in a in another direction and, uh, you know, from where it was. And uh, the key focus, as I see it, is lobbying. So, you know, Kath is, is super involved with lobbying at uh, all sorts of different uh, levels of government and, uh, and doing a great job and having a, having a real impact. The other thing that um, she's doing is, uh, is a lot in education and, you know, this Innovate conference that we had uh, on Tuesday... One of the best I've been to, and that was as a result of Kath and her team. Um, that's awesome. That's, uh, you know, I, I think it's creating a, a better industry or, you know, better membership. Maybe that is awesome to hear, you know, and, and I think that is, you know, sometimes it takes good people from outside our profession to give us a bit of a wake-up call and just to not regurgitate the same old stuff different year. So, you know, to look at those opportunities and uh, well, well done to Rewa then. I saw REIV have put a, a new CEO on, um, which is awesome, uh, a lady, um, and uh, it was interesting watching some of the old guards saying, she's not from real estate, what would she know, how would she qualify for this stuff? Or, I can't, you know, and I actually challenged a few people on LinkedIn over that because I mean, mate, the fact that she's not of real estate world is a really good, healthy thing. Um, mm. You know, to to fresh set of eyes. She comes from media and she comes from sport and and uh, uh, you know, good commercial background. So you know, um, that, that's awesome. Well done. So, do the CEOs of of the modern real estate agency do they need to have a, a real estate practitioner's background or, or could uh, we potentially see some some CEOs of, of some of the bigger um, organisations be non-real estate practitioners? Oh, I, I think that's a, I think that's very healthy. On the proviso, I mean, I don't think they have to have a real estate background or have to spend time on the shop floor. I think your boards can look after that stuff. I think that's the, you know, it's the balance that, that a, that a good board can bring, or membership directors or member directors. Um, I think someone that's got a good 
outside business background can break some of the shackles of the of the the old norms that we get used to you know um, mm -hmm. um because we do get used to some old norms in this industry um and uh so no i think there's a massive opportunity for them to open our eyes up and for us to start thinking about different ways as long as they spend a little bit of time like it's that old saying pete you know you got to spend two moons in the other man's moccasins and so to spend a little bit of time with your top eight or 10 customers at various levels so you get an understanding about what their challenges are and what works for them, what doesn't, where they might know to hand. You've got that grapple, you've got that bit sort of then, then oh, you know, I don't think you need to have a real estate agent certificate as well. You know, it's, you know, you, you weren't employed to be a real estate agent, you were employed to, you know, to transform or modernize or, you know, or to take this institute onto its next evolution. Let's go back to the office of the future. Um, yes. A mate of mine, um, and you know him reasonably well, um, has been operating a reasonably successful office for the past, well, since 19, let's say 1990. Um, so a while. Um, and his model is still six reps 300 plus property manager managements and i just think that he is setting himself up for failure um will no doubt there'll be moments in that he'll make a decent profit and do okay but by and large he is a training ground for the agency so he'll train people up they'll shuffle on to the big commissions offered by the agency um, and uh, I just question whether that model is oh, I think you're absolutely on it I think I think those words <clears throat> that those businesses operate as a training ground uh, you know a platform for people to further their careers so you know, you know they'll probably train it for the next two three years you know get them up and running and then they'll lose them uh, and they'll say what happened there? Well, it's just evolution. That's what happens there. Um, you know, they'll go for bigger dollars. They'll go for a you know a flashier car, a bigger a bigger name on the on the, the signboard. You know, more support. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't believe that's sustainable. I think those businesses will continue to churn. You know, you'll just you know it'll be you know you know be you know six people, two coming, two going, two not sure what's going on. Um, and that's not, you know, that's not sustainable, particularly at the cost, Pete, of running a business these days. So you've got the cost as well as trying to be at the forefront of innovation. I mean, I, I sat at the RISA uh, South Australian REI conference a couple of weeks ago and I watched uh, their, their, their uh, chair, Kane Cook, interview Susanna Toop from Toop and Toops, you know, a legendary business in, um, in uh, South Australia, in Adelaide. And Toops have got their own in-house developers uh, to look after their technology. They talked openly about what they're doing with AI. You know, they, they are unassailable. You know, the stuff they're doing and the size of the business, you know, they were just happy to give it all because they know that, you know, probably 2% of people in the room have actually got the ability to do, you know, most of what's there unless they invest. You know, so I kind of look at that and I go, you know, the model is, for, for me, the model is changing. You're going to have these big offices, uh, and we're seeing them already, whether it's the urban X's or, you know, there's a variation of place or um, you know, there's a few of them floating around where someone else is looking after all the back-end support, doing all the book work, all the trust accounting, all the innovation, arranging the tech stack, making it happen and just saying, there you go, just go out and sell real estate because that's what you're probably pretty bloody good at. But asking a business owner, asking that, the guy you're talking about there to be a leader in AI and digital marketing and, you know, um, you know, we fall into a trap and reality just says this, you know, you and I go back, you know, let's go, you know, you and I spending time in the States in the, the you know, the late 2000s um, or, you know, to 2009, 2010, 2011, looking at the opportunity and the evolution of social media and websites and so much that it can do, but our industry and our practitioners abrogated their responsibility to actually do something about it. And that's why REA and Domain and 
you know, I, I, I can't comment on Rewa. It wouldn't be fair to me to do that. But that's why they have prospered and grown because our people abrogated their responsibility. There was so much opportunity, but they did nothing about it. And now they sit back and bitch and moan and groan and carry on and say, oh, you know, they're taking our money away. Well, you know, sorry. You know, you did nothing about growing a really nice website or providing great content or writing weekly blogs or doing wonderful videos or, you know, understanding Facebook ads or any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's why, you know, those businesses that think they can ignore the new opportunities um, and just continue to do what they've always done are destined for failure. That's a long way of saying exactly what you said before. It's not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I read that um, or oh, oh, watched a video uh, recently of um, and somebody who said the, 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 the single biggest predictor of success in, um, in sales is the amount of time facing the customer. So mm. um, if you spend a lot of time facing the customer, you are going to make more sales. Um, and... Um, to, to your point, it's like with those small operators, they're always juggling, well, do I spend time researching how to advertise on Facebook or do I spend two hours in front of a customer on a listing presentation? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a tricky balance. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is, but it's a balance. You don't have much choice in... in uh in saying that you, know, you go where the dollars are and that's belly to belly, toes to toes, nose to nose. It's talking to the customers. Mm. It's creating opportunities. And it's that, you know, it was a great old saying you and I learned, you know, a bazillion years ago when we were talking about social networking. And it was only when people would say, oh, well, I'm social networking. And you go, actually, you're actually social not working. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. You know, you know, you're messing around on Facebook is not social, you know, is not social networking. It's messing around on Facebook. So be honest and say messing around on Facebook. And then, and then, but then. I thought, you're I thought get... my TikTok addiction was going to pay off. Damn. <laughs> well, look, isn't there an opportunity there? You know, isn't that a massive opportunity? And you and I, you know, a company acts about that, about some people that you're seeing really carving it up over there. And, and oh, there's uh, a guy so... called Corey Adamson over here. Um, and look, he is a, a very good looking rooster. Um, and, uh, he just answers, answers questions all day long on TikTok. And he's got something like 85,000 plus followers. It's just like, and this is just a, a, a real estate agent from, from Florida. It's, uh, he's doing okay. Good on you. And that's, you know, that's someone who's identified an opportunity and said, that's where I'm going to go. You know, oh, look, I love it, Pete. You know, I, I for, for a period of time, you know, I, well, I still own a website called, you know, it's a lead generation website. It's dormant, so I, I'm not trying to plug it. Um, and, and I, you know, it's having it a conversation. sale at the right price, just call. It is for sale at the right price. <laughs> <laughs> it is for sale. Um, and, but, but it's, you know, I ran a series of, of uh, Facebook ads for a, for a, former client up in Tumor. And um, uh, and we generated in a week, we spent $75 and we generated 22 opportunities. Um, there were 15 people that filled in the online form that said, I'm interested in the market, and seven people filled in the online form to say, I'm thinking of selling. 22 responses for 74 bucks. And so I said to the client, you know, it's a pretty good response, so you should be really happy with that. I think it's amazing. Do you want to go again with some more next week? He said, no, well, I'm going to drop those. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm dropping that. That's not working for me. And I said, why is that? It's two parts. One, he said, uh, I, I, I emailed each of those people. And none of them were ready to list today. I went, <laughs> but the fact that they filled in an online form <laughs> says that, you know, let's buy them a bottle of champagne. Let's take them on a slow dance. Let's nurture. Let's create an opportunity. Let's create a relationship. So I said to him, this is the second part. I said, so, so um, Daryl or Darren, Darren, what, so what, what are you going to do in setting? If we're dropping that, and that's cool, what are we going to do? So I'm going back to letterbox dropping. <laughs> okay. So, so you're going to buy 10,000 bits of shit Less. for 700 bucks, and you're going to pay someone 700 bucks to drop those 10,000 bits of shit in people's letterboxes. That's 1,400 bucks. <laughs> so, so just remind me, when's the last time that someone came into your office with one of those bits of shit and said, oh, my God. 
oh, I can't wait. I can't miss this once in a lifetime opportunity. A real estate agent will be in my street next week offering free appraisals. This is unheard of. It's amazing. I said, Tell me, when's the last time you got a response like that? And he said, Well, it's never happened. And I said, Then what? You're going to spend 1400 bucks. Right? So we miss the opportunities. We miss the market. And we don't understand how to use, how to convert those. 22 and, and take them on a slow dance and put them into our CRM and, you know, nurture them along. We're going to go back to those old tools. And so, you know, the long way we're saying, that, that young fellow that you're talking about who's got those bazillion followers on TikTok has identified an opportunity and he will nurture and grow those over time. And, you know, and, and a percentage of those people will become advocates for him and they'll do business with him. And, and uh, so good on him. I love that. It's a great story. Where's the career path? for the the new breed of real estate agents coming through. So when, when I started out, I started as a commission only sales rep. Um, how Why David James and Graham Brown gave me a job, I'm really not sure, um, but they did and I'm very grateful for it. Um, but that career path of commission only sales rep um, and then you do your license studies, become a licensee, start your own business. It's pretty much no longer there. What's the what's the career progression from here? Where where do the, where does all the, the the newbies in in real estate? How will their career play out from here? Cool. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's not there because we're not making it be there. Um, we, I think we're attracting some of the wrong people with the wrong motivations um, uh, that want to express, you know, fast track themselves into celebrity and BMWs and all this stuff mm. straight away. And straight to the Lambo. Don't that's it. There. That's it. And I think it's incumbent upon us or business owners to just get people to cool their jets and probably not put those people on with those. Look, look, it's good to have aspirations. That's fantastic. But it's got to be tempered with reality. For a period of time, I was running the careers nights for the REIQ over here. And I would get people, I wouldn't say young people, I'd get people say to me, oh, you know, yeah, I'm thinking about a career in real estate. I'm really excited about this. Um, I can go to XYZ office at Sunnybank and get 92%. Why would I want to go there somewhere else for fifty percent? And I said, because because ninety two percent of nothing's nothing. Um, you know, so, and I go on to say, you know, if you can get twenty five percent, I'd be inclined to run with that on the basis that you find a business where your values are aligned with the business owner, where the business owner is there to help to nurture your career over a period of time. If you're coming to this business with stars in your eyes, you're going to be doing five deals a month, you know, in, in three months' time, and you know, then you know you are going to be a freak if that happens, and there ain't too many freaks around. So I think we've got a responsibility as business owners to temper things back a bit and actually give people almost an apprenticeship in real estate. It works for plumbers, it works for electricians, it works for everyone else. We try to fast track people into fame straight away and Jesus, they create some havoc on the way through. And it becomes about the BMW and the watch collection and the fame and the, you know, like, can we just hit the reset button on all that stuff and look at the long-term opportunity and the long game? You and I seem to survive pretty well and most good operators you know, they've still got a relationship and a family and a, you know, and some assets and some sanity of people that have played the long game in this business. Um, so I think there's an obligation on business owners uh, and, we, as, and as a profession to stop propagating this bullshit myth of celebrity real estate agent. It's not That's good for there, anyone. That, 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 oh, is, is. that is out there and it's... it's... I, I, that genie's not getting put, put back in the bottle. Um, we've uh, we've got um, Lux Listing Sydney, where yeah. the the whole premise of the show is built around. Um, uh, well, unlike the US versions of uh, let's say Selling Sunset, where they uh, they they actually put the amount of commission that they earn on the on the screen, which you know, they're staggering numbers. Mm. Uh, over here, they just hint at the commissions they're earning via their cars and their fancy boats and their 
their uh, their fancy suits. Are we? Is there any? I don't think there's a way of putting that genie back in the bottle. But is there a way of of creating some form of competing narrative that is less money focused? Yeah, I th- absolutely. I think there is. I, I think absolutely. I think there is. I don't know. I can't say that I've seen anyone that's nailed it. Uh, there's probably a, um, one of the larger independents over here that's doing a relatively good job of talking about where you started this about career progression. So we're going to start. You know, so here's an example. I was <clears throat> recruiting a guy for a, a client of mine. Uh, we found a guy who's 25 years of age. He was, pretty, he was very interested, and he said, I'm deciding between whether it work for you guys or this rather large independent group. He said, they've offered me three days in their office just to get a feel for what they're like, and he said, so I'm thinking I'll, spend, I'll take that free, those three days, sorry, and just see what they're like before I consider coming to you guys. And I went, that's fine. That's great, Josh. Go and do that. Anyway, I rang him the day before. He was due to start. I rang him on the Sunday afternoon before he was starting for this three-day trial. And I said, how you going? What are you up to? And he said, um, I thought I'd just check in with him. And he said, I'm out prospecting. And I said, you're prospecting? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, uh, and I said, but I thought you'd start tomorrow. He said, yeah, yeah. But he said, before I can start, I have to identify the addresses of 25 properties that I believe could be available for sale, had, had characteristics of being properties that could be for sale. You know, the fence was falling down, the grass was overgrown, there's an old car wreck in the front yard, whatever it might be. He said, I have to drive around my farm area and, and write down the addresses of those 25 properties. And, and I can't start on day one unless I have those 25 addresses. And he said, then my, I'm told my first task on day one then is to uh, search those properties, put them into the database, find the phone numbers of those people and ring those people and talk to them about their property. And they've got any thoughts about selling, yada, yada, yada. Now, that is, that's been really clear of that's what you're doing and that's what you're going to be doing. And he was told that would be his job for the first 12 months. Identify opportunities, create a certain amount of leads for the, you know, for the salespeople above him. And, and uh, anyway, um, we ended up winning him and he did an amazing job. And, and as a sideline of that, it was funny. I said to him, I said, look, part of this job is, um, part of this job will require a bit of door knocking. This particular agent that we was going to be working for, Door docking was important in the inner city area. And he said, oh, I'm okay with that. I'm really happy to door knock. And I said, you're 23 or 25 years of age, you're happy to door knock? Where's that come from? He said, he said, my family is Jehovah's Witnesses. He said, <laughs> he said since, since, since I've been, since I was three years of age, my parents have been pushing me up the driveway saying, there you go, Josh, you go first. And he said, no one ever slams the door at a three-year-old kid. And I'd hand out the, whatever the book was that came out. So he said, door knocking is no problem for me. He actually excelled at it. Um, so maybe we're going to start prospecting with all the Jehovah's and the, the Mormons. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know whether you ever knew this, but uh, that ground is very familiar with for me. Um, because... <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when I yeah when I was asked uh, whether I had any problems with the one hocking, I'm just going, man, you know that's my bread and butter. Just <laughs> bring it on, bring it on. Just like and and all the people that ever worked for me, God, they come in. Oh, I don't like door knocking. I'm just so frightened. And I go. Dude, what's there to be frightened of? Like, they could just say no, just, just go and knock on the door. Hi. I love it. It's, yeah. it's funny. It's, and it's funny because in this particular guy's uh, case, uh, he would do that all day. Oh, yeah. And I said, okay, we need to start making some calls. So we started talking about telephone calls. And and, uh, and I said, so uh, we need to do two hours phone calls this afternoon. This is after a few months of being with us. <laughs> he had everything perfect on the desk. He had the spreadsheet, the telephone numbers, the addresses of the people. You know, it was just looked magnificent. I said, you know, I said, so we're now one hour and 45 minutes into the two hours. We still haven't picked up the phone. He had a fear of picking up the phone and talking to people. He couldn't do that. He could do that. Build on doors wow. every day, but actually picking up the phone and, and talking to people. Fascinating, isn't it? Wow. Um, which is, you know, I mean, do people need... Do we need phone calls these days? That's a whole other conversation. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I don't know what, what was my, what was the point there. Look, so I think I think the the obligation is more on 
on us to recruit the right kind of people and explain to them that this is going to take time and we're with them for the long haul and we will and our values will be shared and we'll help them on listing presentations but we need you know we need their support on the way through and as i used to say to people at our careers nights for the reiq look you are a liability to this business for probably the first six to 12 months in all honesty you're going to cost me business you're going to be a distraction you're going to cost me time but i'm prepared to invest in you um but i need you know but i need you to be in for the long haul with me and if you're good and i'll pay you 25 or 30 percent now and don't worry i'm happy to pay you more if you absolutely build it out of the park so if you build out of the park and do a bucket load of business we could renegotiate the fee anytime you like if you're doing the numbers but this is going to be a long-term relationship that I will nurture you through and give you a great real estate career. It's like this there's a young bloke playing for the West Tigers Football Club in Sydney at the moment. He's 18 years of age and he wants to be released from his contract because he doesn't think the team's going well enough and, you know, and he wants to go somewhere else. Buddy, you're 18. You haven't got hair on your chin yet. You've got another 20 years left in your, in your, your football career. Just do the apprenticeship where you are um, before you... You know, the size there's, of the part of, there, there's part of me that loves that about the the new kids coming through that they have this sense of self belief that I'm going to ask for what I want and they they step out and get what they want and there's another part of me that cringes a bit and thinks oh just have a bit of humility and just earn your stripes yeah. um, so I'm fascinated by the, the likes of um, Gavin Rubenstein um, simply because that personal brand, the, the Rubenstein brand is situated inside of or alongside of a very big brand called Ray White. Um, mm -hmm. And traditionally the, the personal brands and, and uh, corporate brands haven't worked well together yet somehow Ray White have managed to let that brand off the chain and yet somehow include the Ray White component in there. Is, is that something that, it, that businesses of the future are going to have to juggle um, and, and get right? And, and how are they going to do it? Have you given any thought to that? I had to say, yeah. And, and simply the answer is they don't have a choice. The, you know, the, the franchise groups don't have a choice. It's really, really simple. Um, is you've got those freaks like Gavin and others that come along who are just, you know, they they're just going to knock it out of the park. And so you either find a way to work with them, otherwise they're trailblazers and they'll continue on. Um, you know, so you know, of course it's insane, but stroke their ego enough, give them the right support that they need. You know, put them on a few stages. Um, you know, and and support them. Um, that, that's what you've got to do. I remember, Pete, um, and, and so we're talk, <clears throat> talking about Ray White, and, I, and I'll, I'll get the years wrong, it was when Remax came to Australia. And I'll, I'll talk from my own uh, position. So we had the office in Manly for professionals for many, many moons, and uh, uh, Ray White brought, Ray White had made the decision at the time. Um, they had 21 salespeople, I think, in their office at, at Winning. And they'd made the decision at a corporate level that uh, no longer could you have after hours stickers on for sales signs with the salesperson's name and telephone number on it. Mm -hmm. um, that that there would just be one telephone number on the sign, um, you know, Ray White Wynnum, phone number. And um, there'd been a, the new um, award had come in for salespeople. And you know, it, was, it was just one of those magic moments in time. Um, and at the same time, uh, Remax entered Australia. And they came in and said, you want a bigger sign? You want your name in a bigger font on it? You want some after hours stickers and your own number on it? Knock yourself out, baby. You want 92%? No worries. We can do that for you. Go as hard as you like. And so it was that, you know, the moons aligned. And, and you know, in, a, in one week, um, there were, you know, 17 people walked out of the Ray Watt office to the Remax, to the brand new Remax office down the road, paid their monthly desk fee of 3800 bucks or whatever, and, and away they went. They had their name as big and bold as they wanted, um, you know, on the sign and their own photos and all that kind of stuff. And um, so, 
So, you know, there was the alternative. And, you know, what's at that stage said, no, nah, you know, we're not, we're not working to any of that kind of stuff. Well, the market kind of dictated that they had to do that. Otherwise, the losses were just going to continue. And I bring it forward to 22, 23, 24, and we're seeing more and more of that now. Um, so absolutely. Franchise groups um, have to reconsider what their offering is. If you look at it, Pete, um, you know, most businesses – if they're honest, we'll tell you that 90%, most businesses on the Eastern Seaboard will tell you that 90% of their business comes from REA. So if 90% of your business is, is coming from REA, then why are you paying 10% or 8% or whatever it might be to a franchise group? What are they actually delivering that's, that makes you, if you turn it over, you know, I don't know, um, you know, four million, five, four million, five million bucks for the fees. Um, what are they delivering for that three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year that you're giving them? And they got to start thinking real long and hard about what that is, you know. And if it doesn't relate to more stock and more staff, then it's probably a challenge because if you can solve that problem for a suburban real estate agent of getting them more stock and more staff, uh, if you solve that problem, you've probably got a franchise. Franchise C for life. Um, so I, I don't think the, the franchise groups have got any any choice but to start seriously looking at their model um, and allowing for um, business owners like Gavin and and those entrepreneurs underneath them um, the latitude to do some to be a bit more um, you know a be a bit more um, flamboyant in the things that they do. The days of Fit in, well, you know, um, uh, and you know, you, you know, our logo has got to be blah blah. I think that's over. So, some of the franchise groups, such as um, Harcourts um, and both Harcourts and Ray White, hang their hat on training. They invest a lot in training, and from what I understand, uh, from talking to some of their people, the training is. Excellent. Um, at that conference, one of the, the the third speaker of the day was um, uh, oh, his name escapes me, uh, but he's the head of digital strategy for Ray White. Okay. Um, and uh, Mark Jackson, someone. Yeah, you might be right, J Jason. Red, uh, I think it. That's right. Anyway, doesn't matter. Older guy, be you know, about my age, our age. Um, really switched on, um, and gave us a bit of a demonstration of their their nurturing. Um, model there that like they've got this database a kind of a customer yeah, nurture cloud uh, yeah uh, yeah nurture cloud that i think that's what it was called um yeah. and um i thought wow that is that's an offering there um that's that's something that would uh a attract people and b keep people there yeah, yeah, I agree. I, you know, so I'm I'm aware of their tech stack, and and uh, you know, the, I think it's like there's 21 different products they've got that you know, and you know, they had Vault, and I think that's on the way out, and Nurture Cloud's coming in to replace that. Um, so I think it is is um, absolutely those kind of tools that help our business owner. I mean, I'm aware that Nurture Cloud not only will help you with um, um, uh, prospecting for new business and also help you prospect for salespeople. So it will interrogate the market and come back and tell you this salesperson's doing this and this and this. Here's some, you know, here's some things you might consider talking to competing salespeople about in a recruitment drive. So, you know, they're kind of doing that really, well, really, really, really well. Back to general training. Um, yeah, I think most of the franchise groups are having a good crack at um, at providing good quality training. My question there is, and, and I think it's it's got a place. My question is, why aren't business owners taking that responsibility on internally themselves to train? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's you know, sometimes I get it that you might want to outsource that stuff, but but I think you know nothing better for me is good training sessions with your own people, you know, doing it your way. I love the old the Muralbark team of Jeff Ernie and his crew that had, they have a policy of one best way. Um, not seeing you know, 65 salespeople, 
not 65 best ways, was one, one best way. I love that Jeff um, had his, had, would have his team in and say, when you work for us, it's um, black pants, black shoes, black socks, white shirt, company tie, name badge, you know, on the, on the pocket. Um, and if you turn up at a sales meeting or a meeting with anything other than black pants, black socks, black shoes, white shirt, company tie, you know, turn, then your job is to explain to the other 64 people <laughs> why they should go buy your green tie or brown shoes or whatever it might be. And if you can do that, everyone goes out and buys 64 green ties and whatever. If not, one best way. Um, and, you know, now that might it's seem really, a little bit... Clearly, <laughs> clearly you didn't work there. Otherwise, they'd be all wearing <laughs> colourful shirts. I was amazed they actually allowed me to trade for them, um, but but it's a, you know but a great business, and that may be too extreme. Um, but you know, but I love the fact that that we, they did a lot of training in house, and there was just one best way to do things. Um, um, so anyway, probably doesn't mean a lot, but I, you know, um, I think you know I think we got to take the responsibility of training our people internally on the way that we do things around here. Do the does the real estate institute? The, the franchises, do they, and the marketing groups, do they have any sort of responsibility in the affordability space to, to address the problem of homelessness? Is that is that the real estate industry's problem or is that a government problem or is it a bit from column A and a bit from column B? Yeah, I think it's the latter. It is, it's government's problem, um, but it doesn't mean that we should, shouldn't, uh, you know, get involved um, and be supported. And, and uh, because, you know, we want a healthy real estate market, I think we have a unique position in our profession to influence change um, and to provide a healthy market. And that means responsibilities with, uh, you know, with the 10 bazillion dollar homes as well as the people are doing are tough. I'll give you a couple of things that we're doing over here that are important to make is more than 36% of Queenslanders rent, and that number's continuing to grow. We've got a vacancy rate across the state of less than 1%, so clearly massive pressure uh, on, on the rental market. Um, and we, we're starting to see more and more people, uh, we're, in fact, up to 15% of rent rolls now are starting to see a new um, cohort of people who are all of a sudden experiencing financial crisis they never thought they'd experience through cost of living and through increased rents. We're talking people, Pete, that are you know earning really good money, 150 grand a year or better, all of a sudden are finding themselves, oh my God, our rent's gone up by 100 or 150 bucks a week. The cost of living has gone crazy. And all of a sudden they're going, Jesus, we can't make ends meet. And on the research that we've done suggests that up to 15% of rent rolls, oh, sorry, 15% of, of tenancies, are at risk from these people who are now forced into this situation to go into something that they've never experienced before. And those people are now, you know, pride is a massive issue for those people. Um, and and the work that we're doing uh, with the Tenancy Skills Institute, which is a relationship we have with the REIQ, is trying to do the best that we can to sustain those tenancies, to stop those people ending up on TECA. Because once they end up on TECA or on a tenancy database, they got some problems, and so so that's that's the initial part. the 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 part that supports that is that I was at a I was lucky enough to be at a presentation at a school um, towards towards the Gold Coast a couple of weeks back, where we uh, presented certificates to the twenty thousandth student that we put through the Tenancy Skills Institute course. It's a two day course, so two days in person or eight hours online where it teaches you to be how to be a good tenant. And it's not a it's not a remedial course. In fact, I think it's actually a course that everyone should do starting at school. Um, and it teaches people, and some people will be offended by this, but it teaches how to budget. It teaches how to clean. It teaches how to communicate with your property manager. It teaches how to be a good neighbour. All the skills that help you. And at the end of that course, you get a certificate. Now, I don't know about you, Fletch, but when I went to school, they used to send the Commonwealth Bank along to teach us how to get a credit card. I'd much rather that we were sending people like the Tenancy Skills Institute along to teach kids, you know, young adults, 
that you know that you'll be moving out of home at some stage and to have a fair chance of being in the rental market these are the things you'll need to do to be to show show that you you know how to budget that you know how to clean that you know how to communicate that you know how to how to be a good neighbor um and that here's here's a certificate to the course that you've done the course so and they're all skills that we are just abundantly qualified to teach yep and so i see that Property managers know that, like, they, they just eat, sleep and breathe that stuff. That's it. So if we can start to change behaviours from the early stages and have that as not just a remedial course for people that, are doing, that have had troubles, but for everyone and give them these life skills that give everyone an equal opportunity when 50 people turn up for a rental, uh, you know, to, for a rental viewing, um, that they can say, well, here's my, you've done this, the, the the course, so, you know, the two-day course. Here's my certificate. I understand about budgeting, planning, communication, um, and uh, and how to be a good neighbour. Um, you know, it starts to even things up a bit. In fact, it probably starts to give an advantage to people in the past that might not have had it. So that's one of the things that I'm really pursuing. And um, and uh, secondly, then there's also that how we deal with these these you know, this fifteen percent of rent rolls of people that are this emerging. We've got some challenges. You know, how do we make sure that we work with them, that we don't just cast them away? And then the other thing we're doing is working with a project um, called Homes for Homes. Um, and that's just a project where it allows people to bequeath, um, uh, I think it's 0.5% of the value of their home when they pass on or whatever it might be. So, you know, when you, when you, when you pop off the perch, um, a contribution is made from the sale of your home, and it might be several thousand dollars, and it goes to the Homes for Homes, whose sole focus is about providing uh, accommodation for homeless people um, in uh, or social housing uh, in the respective state in which you reside. So, so absolutely, I think we've got you know we've got a responsibility to do that stuff, and we have the ability to, Pete. You know, that's the thing. Mm. Um, you know, we're in that unique, unique position of power that we can influence this stuff. So, you know, let's flex for the right reason instead of flexing about a suburb record. You know, let's flex about... In fact, we don't even need to flex. We just need to do it, you know. Um, if you want to do a mm. PR, you know, launch about it as well, that's great. But, you know, just do it. Makes you a better human being. Makes you feel yeah. good and we can contribute. And and possibly let's have uh, changed the narrative in Australia from uh, I'm just renting to... Um, have it have renting a property not be sort of a, a second option or a you know let's be okay with with people renting and renting for in some cases life. Yeah, I, 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 totally, totally. You know, you know, I, I, no one can really give me an answer on this now. But why why wouldn't we? Why why wouldn't we consider giving someone a five year lease on a property? You know, people go, oh, well, I, we only and ever do six months Less inspections leases. and less yeah. inspections, Pete. You know, we, yeah. we we earn, a you know, like 95 bucks every time you go out and do a a, 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 a routine inspection. Well, how about we, we recognise that some tenants, a lot of tenants, I should say, uh, a lot of tenants are quality, they, they live a quality life, um, uh, they're, they're clean, they're neat. They're not never going to cause any damage. Do an inspection once a year or once every two years instead of once every quarter. Well, we we are our processes are prime for a serious shake up. And I heard Nigel Dalton, who his former life was uh, Nigel had the best title in the world. He was the chief inventor for REA Group. And he used to walk around their offices in a lab coat. You know, I don't believe you have probably met Nigel. Um, and Nigel talked about how key we are, how open we are for disruption. But he talked about Amazon coming in and looking after property management. You know, if you just you paid your rent through the Amazon app, you went to the Amazon app and you booked a you know, you said, oh, my hot water system staffed or the pool needs cleaning or whatever. You just did that. And Amazon just went, Farm the job out to five tilers or five plumbers or five, you know, whatever it might be. It's just all automatically done. We are absolutely prime for disruption in that. I was at that, I think I told you this, I was at the RESA conference last year, I think the year before, and there was um, Chris Rolls, 
did this wonderful presentation, and he had um, he had two property managers on stage, each with their own whiteboard, and he said, "Okay." He said, I'd like you to write from start to finish all the steps, all the things that, that you do from the time that the phone rings to the, to the time that you issue a lease to a prospective new tenant. And so the first property manager, a lady of senior years, jumped up and she said, you know, answer the phone call, take the tenant's de- the applicant's details, arrange a time to meet them, or describe the property, arrange a time to meet them, uh, book the time, um, go, you know, go, get the, go to the key cupboard, get the keys. Go to the car, drive to the property. You know, um, you know, put the fans on, check the leather box, put the bins out. You know, blah blah blah. blah. Ends up with sixty steps to the time that the lease gets signed. Property manager number two wrote: take phone call, send link to virtual tour, send tenant application form for lease. Wow! And the room erupted. And you can't do that. You can't do that. Well. We did it all the way through COVID. It worked really, really well. It's no problem. And so we don't meet people at properties. We send them a link to the virtual tour. We send them a link to the application form and we send them a copy of the lease. That's it. You go, ah. So, you know, all of these things that we're doing because that's the way we've always done it around here. So, you know, you, I kind of think if Jeff Bezos jumped in and said, hmm, could be a dollar in this property. And it might not be him. It might be someone else. It'll be a really smart you know, you know, like you know, there's been a hell of a heap of people that are crack in that space. Someone's going to nail it and get it right because the market is right for it. And the new consumer is saying, you know, I want speed, I want simplicity, I want personalisation, I want transparency. They're the four trends that drive our world. Um, so, um, uh, you know, and nail those, and uh, all of the hoops that we make people jump through will start to disappear because there'll be a new process. Mm. That, that's all of the conversation. Mm. What um, what is the biggest challenge that uh, is facing the industry right now? That kind of, if anything, keeps you up at night. Oh, um, lack of humility. Yeah, you go. that's mm-hmm. that's probably. Um, that's that. I think is one of the biggest challenges for the, for the, the perception. The five hundred thousand dollar cars and the thirty five thousand dollar suits and the the uh, the fifty thousand dollar watches. Yep, does nothing to warm us to the consumer. Um, you know, I think most consumers sit back. I think most, not everyone, um, but I think most consumers sit back and say, "What a friggin' toss pot." Um, you know, um, what a wanker. And, I, you know, I mean, do we see, you know, that happen in other professions? No, not really. Um, and, and seriously, on an, on an industry or a profession where the barrier to entry is pretty low, um, you know, these people, you know, I mean, I, look, you know, I'm the chairman of their institute over here. I love them, so many of them, but the behaviour scares the living hell out of me. Gosh, you're not curing cancer. You know, you're not saving lives. You're selling houses. And at the moment, you know, in a pretty simple kind of market, you know, my daughter, Lauren, who you know is in the process of trying to buy at the moment, and the behaviour and the lack of communications uh, that, that's being addressed, afforded to her as a buyer is embarrassing. Um, and and I think so many of our people, you know, um, in our profession, uh, remembering that Lauren will be a seller at some stage and that she has a strong social circle of friends who she will be on the weekend explaining to those friends or who the wankers were who ignored her during the week or didn't put her office on paper or didn't treat her with courtesy or, you know. So, you know, I think we just need to reassess, you know, um, you know what we're about and what values. You know, there's a actually used to do business with down the Gold Coast who... Um, you know, this was classic. He had a beautiful Mercedes Benz that lived in his garage all week. Um, they only came out on weekends when he took his family for a drive. The rest of the time, he drove a Commodore, you know, and, uh, and you know, because that was his market, you know, and, you know, and for in his market, if he'd been seen driving around his fancy Mercedes Benz, people would have gone, you're not one of us, you know, um, again, a whole other conversation. But yeah, I just think we've got to get back to, you know, humility, you know. 
this whole celebrity agent thing, I don't know, okay, you know, I think it does bad things for the consumer. I think it also does some really bad things inside the industry around the expectations of people. And I think we have a serious mental health problem coming across the profession where people are, if you're not earning a million bucks a year and if you're not driving a BMW and if you're not snorting coke with your mates or if you're not doing all these things, you're a failure. Are you even a real estate agent if you're not doing that stuff? And quite frankly, if you're knocking out 100 grand or 150 or whatever, I don't care. If your customers appreciate you and you're doing a good job and and, uh, and you enjoy what you're doing, then it's about you and you've got a happy family. And you're not snorting up coke and you're, you know, you know, you know you're not you're not overly stressed about where the next feed's coming from. If if that's you, baby, bring it on. I want more of you. Um, mm. You know that. You know, um, so, you know, look, I could read about this forever because this whole, you know, we lost a um, we lost a young bloke on the Gold Coast a couple of years back now, David John Newlands, who left us um, 16th of January 2022, I think. Um, you know, an amazing, you know, a ridiculous amount of pressure on him to fit in and be everything that everyone else wanted him to be. And he just felt that he wasn't, you know, keeping up with where he, you know, he thought he should be. And so he left this world. Um, and... Uh, that to me is just crazy that we've got young people feeling all this ridiculous pressure. Mm. So, well, I think that's uh, that's a topic for another podcast, Pete. Uh, this this one this podcast has gone this episode's gone for roughly twice as long as my usuals. Oh, I'm sorry, um, mate. But, <laughs> but it's just been fantastic to to just shoot the breeze with you and uh you know talk about some of the issues that we think uh are important for the industry that as i said earlier has served us very well yeah it has pete so, thank you I, I, yeah mate I, look love having a great chat with a good human being and and uh uh it was both of those so anytime i can have a chat love to mm. all right well um I'll, uh, I guess we'll leave it at there. Uh, the next um, episode of uh, the um, the State of Origin, when's that? Oh, I think um, Wednesday week, I think. Um, Queensland is one up at this stage, hoping to get the second one uh, knocked over. So I think, yeah, I think Wednesday week is our next game. Be nice one to up stick thanks those to a races. very dubious send-off decision, I've got oh, to say. Oh, but... no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a great decision. I loved it. <laughs> uh, on that note, uh, Pete, thanks again. And uh, until next week, this has been Peter Fletcher for the WA Property uh, Q&A podcast. And that wraps up another episode of the WA Property Q&A. We hope you found our discussion valuable and gained some valuable insights into the world of property buying in Western Australia. Remember, while we strive to provide useful information, it's crucial to consult with the appropriate professionals before making any investment decisions. Don't forget to tune in next week for another exciting episode where we continue to unravel the mysteries of the WA property market. If you have any questions or topic suggestions, feel free to reach out to us. Until then, happy property hunting and remember to seek the right advice for your personal circumstances. Thank you for listening.